You know, every time I get invited to speak at a men's conference, I, my inclination is to say yes. I started pastoring when I was 21 years old. The church that I started pastoring at had four men and 18 people total. And I would go into that little church during the week, and I would pray up and down the pews, and I would say, God, I have four men. Like, where are the men? And I would say, Lord, give me 12. I would complain to God, you had, Jesus had 12. I just want 12, Jesus, give me 12 men. Uh, I realize the scarcity of godly men in the city. After a while, I started praying, God, I, I don't care. They could be toothless, jobless. I Just give me 12 men. I sound like some of the ladies out there praying for a husband. Um, so every time I get an opportunity to speak to men, I count it a great privilege to do so. Today, I want to talk to you about not giving it up. Don't give it up. You know, I believe that there's a lot of men that give up their calling, give up their influence, give up their spiritual destiny and their heritage. They release it. They give it up. Not because they're not called, not because they can't influence, not because they don't have leadership, but because it's hard to hang on to it sometimes, and they give it up. Uh, several years back, I was speaking at an event in San Diego, and I had gone with a couple of friends who had never been down to Mexico, and so... Uh, there was, uh, I, I went with my wife, and there was another couple, uh, two other couples that were there, and they said, hey, Mexico's only 30 minutes away. What if we rent a van and travel down into Mexico, at least we can say we were there and eat some good food and then travel back? And so I said, okay, I'll do that. So I went down to the rental car place, and I said, I'd like to rent a a van for the day, I'm going to travel down. Is there a problem with me traveling down into Mexico? No problem. But he looked at me and said, beware. He said, last week there was a couple that rented a van. They drove through Tijuana, Mexico. The police there stopped them, asked them to get out of the van. They got out of the van, and then the police got into the vehicle and drove off with the van and left them stranded. So he said, beware. Beware of the police back in the day, he said, because they're crooked. And so I said, all right. So I got in the van and I drove down to Mexico. We were having a good time, went through the border, had a nice meal. I'm on my way back. I'm driving the van. And someone says, hey, there's a motorcycle cop behind you. And I'm like, yeah. And I look in my rearview mirror, and there he is. Lights on. Some of you know that feeling very well. In fact, some of you know that very often. <laughs> and so I thought, well, and he was going like this, pulling me over. And so I pulled over to the side of the, 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 the road, and immediately I thought, he's going to take my van. I can't give it up. And so the car was getting very nervous. People inside were saying, hey, it's going to happen like they told us. He's going to take our van. We're going to be left stranded. I said, don't worry. I'm going to try not to give it up. The policeman came to me with dark sunglasses. I noticed a revolver in his holster there. And in Spanish, he starts to tell me. I, I speak Spanish. So I understood what he said. He starts to tell me that I had uh, switched lanes and that I was going too fast, switched lanes without a, 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 a turn signal. And I said, well, I don't remember doing that, officer. And he looked at me and said, well, you did. I said, okay, so you're going to write me a ticket? He said, he was standing there. He said, no, pull over into that alley up there, and then we'll talk. And then I thought, oh, for sure. It's happening. The car's getting nervous. My wife is saying, just... Just 
What are you going to do? Someone in the back of the car is saying, take off. <laughs> Sometimes there's bad advice out there. So I pulled into the alley and I kept my foot on the gas pedal and, and, and in gear, I'm like ready to take off whenever I have to. And the cop came up to me again, dark sunglasses, and he says, you know, I'm going to have to, I said, are you going to write me a ticket? He says, no, I'm going to have to take you down to the police headquarters. I, I said, for a ticket? Yeah, that's what we have to do. And he, you know, when someone feels like they want some pay off money. I felt like he was saying, I got to take you down to police headquarters. I have to, and I'm like, uh, well, just write me a ticket. He said, no, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. And I, fe I felt like he was waiting for me to give him something. Then he says, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm in a conference. What kind of conference? I'm, I'm a pastor in Chicago. This Mexican police officer with dark sunglasses, revolver on his side, he looks at me and he says, what does Romans 13 say? <laughs> Two things went through my mind. First of all, what in the world does Romans 13 say? <laughs> I'm a pastor. I don't have the whole Bible memorized. Secondly, this is not like Awana's. If I miss this, I go to jail. This is not like a sticker. I need to get this one down. So in my mind, I'm saying, well, Romans 12 says, do not be conformed to this world. He's looking at me like, no, Romans 13. And then it struck me. It's the passage where Paul says that we are to pray for those that are in authority, for they are servants of God. And so I quoted it to him. And as soon as I said that, he took his sunglasses off. He started referring to me as pastor. And, and like, I had won the test. <laughs> and then he said to me, Pastor, the police force in Tijuana needs your prayer. He got in his motorcycle, rode up, and I was like, what just happened? He wrote up to me and says, tell your congregation to pray for us. And he took off. And I had an unbelieving couple in the car with me. They said, what just happened? Romans 13? They, they, they just couldn't figure it out. So, so when you go down to Mexico, remember Romans 13. It, it may get you. I don't know if it works in Chicago, but it may work in Mexico. But you know what? My thought during this whole process is if I give up my van, I'll lose my wheels to my destination. I can't give it up because this vehicle is what gets me to my destination and if I lose it, if I give it up, I'll be stranded. I won't make it back. I won't be able to get there so I, I can't give it up. There's a passage in Scripture that's one of the saddest passages in all of Scripture. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 13. Take your Bibles and turn to it. Because in this passage, we have the story of a man that gave it up. In fact, the Bible talks about this man. He had a unique position called of God. You would know him as the first king of Israel, King Saul. Appointed by God, it tells us. You may know some of, somewhat about the story, but Samuel the prophet finds this tall, well-built man that has the appearance of a king. And through a series of circumstances, he calls him, he anoints him with oil and says, you will be the next king of Israel. And shortly after that, King Saul, Saul is filled with the Spirit. So he's anointed, he's filled with the Spirit, he's called to be king, the first king of Israel. A position that had never been there before. And it's shortly after that, in chapter 13, that we read some of the saddest verses in Scripture, 
when Samuel goes back to Saul and he tells him, your kingdom will now be taken away from you. Your kingdom could have been a kingdom that endured forever, but now it will be taken from you and given to a man after God's own heart. Called of God, anointed of God, filled with the Spirit, promised that if he had been faithful, if he had hang on to it, if he would not have let it go, his kingdom would have endured forever. Do you remember who else was promised that? King David, the Davidic covenant. And how did his kingdom endure forever? His kingdom endured forever because Jesus the Messiah was born through King David, and his kingdom endures until now. We could have been saying, Jesus, son of Saul. We could have been honoring the legacy and traced it back to Saul, but instead, he lost it. He gave it up. He didn't fight for what God had given him. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Don't give it up, because in my mind, I believe that there are men in this auditorium that you're fighting with whether you're going to hang on to it or give it up. In fact, I believe there's probably men in this auditorium that have already given it up. And God is saying to you, you need to retake it. I look at the story of King David and I ask myself, why? Why did he let go of it? He had an opportunity to leave a legacy, to be a difference maker, a world changer. He didn't look for it. God anointed him through Samuel the prophet. He poured oil on his head and said, you will be the king. The Holy Spirit came upon him when he gathered with the prophets, and so not only was he anointed by the prophet, but he was filled with the Spirit, and he was told, you have a charge. You can make a difference. Go for it. God is on your side. But when I think of King Saul's story, I'm hit by his weakness, a weakness that is embedded in the heart of every man in this place, a weakness that men don't like to talk about, but it's there. A weakness that every single man struggles with at one point or another in their life. In fact, a weakness that some of you, as you walked into this auditorium and sat next to someone, it flared its head up in your heart and mind, and it's called insecurity. Men don't like to talk about insecurity, but we all have it. You walk in a room and you wonder, what do people think of me? Do I fit? Do I belong? It's easy to tell the blatantly insecure. Some hide and are awkward around people. And we say they shuffle and look down and we thought they're insecure. Others overcompensate. First time you meet them, they try to tell you how important they are. And, and, and they talk to you about who they know and what they've done and, 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 and how many people, they important people they know and, and, and maybe titles that they have. Why? Insecurity. They're trying to convince you to think highly of them. You may have felt it when you walked in this place and met some people. Hey, do I belong? How do I fit? What do they think of me? It's that part of us that at our very core, at our very, at the very essence of who we are, we're insecure about our worth, our value, our significance. I want to give you Today, as we think of insecurity and giving up our call, I want to talk to you about four 
areas that insecurity can lead you to that you need, you're going to need to fight. Insecurity is not a sin. Insecurity is... It's a struggle. It's a self-identity issue. It's not a sin, but insecurity can lead to sin. It's not a sin, just like fear is not a sin. It's an emotion, but it can lead to rob things from your life that you need to hang on to. Cambridge Dictionary defines insecurity as the feeling of lacking confidence and not being sure of your own abilities or whether people like you or not. If you're taking notes, write this down. Insecurity can lead you to hide when you should be stepping up. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 21 through 24, we have a glimpse of Samuel after he's been anointed, after he's been filled with the Spirit. It tells us in verse 21, but when they gather all of Israel together, they're about to announce the new king. Samuel the prophet is there. This is the big unveiling. And it says, but when they looked for him, he was not to be found. Verse 21, 22, so they inquired further of the Lord, has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, yes, he has hidden himself among the supplies. Wait a second. This is Saul's big unveiling. Where is the leader? Hiding. Now that tells you something about his struggle. And it says in verse 23, they ran and they brought him out and he stood among the people and he was a head taller than any of the others. And Samuel said to all the people, don't you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. And the people shouted, long live the king. He looked like a leader. He was built by, like a leader. He was a big man, a man's man. But inside Deep inside, past the veneer of this impressive physique, was a deep-seated insecurity. Who am I? Do people like me? I've been a pastor in the city of Chicago for a long time. Started in the southwest side of Chicago. The first guys I led to the Lord were, they were a rough crew. My first usher, main usher, you don't want to mess with him. He'd been a gang leader, spent a lot of time in prison, ran weapons and drugs, and so I made him an usher. I remember a guy walking in the church and said, I know you. He said, the last time I saw you, you had a sawed-off shotgun at my head. He said, yeah, take a seat. <laughs> they seemed to listen to him pretty well. I remember we had, a, we had a guy that would come in, and he would sit down, and he was kind of a gangbanger from the neighborhood, a young guy, and he would always look for the pretty girls to sit next to. Usually they were moody students, you know, nice, all real proper, and he would sit next to them, and I don't know what he would say to them, but they would go like this. And so I, I warned him. I said, you can't do that. You can come to church and worship, but you can't sit next to these girls and, you know, whatever you're telling them, they're scandalized. I said, the next time you do it, you're out of here. So I saw him come into church during worship, and he, he made his way, sure enough, to some pretty girls, and he sat next to them, and he started whispering to them. And I motioned to the ushers, you know, the usher that came out of a gang background. And so during the worship, he went up to them. I saw them talking, and this guy gra grabbed onto his chair. Like they were telling him, you got to get out. He grabbed onto his chair. Next thing I know, this is during worship, my ushers have him picked up in his chair, and they're walking them down the aisle, two big ushers like this. He's grabbing onto his chair, and they put him in the foyer out there. So this is the kind of ushers I had. 
But I noticed something. I noticed that sometimes these big, tough, burly guys that seemed intimidating on the outside, when I really got down to it, when I really talked to them, there were deep-seated insecurities. Tough on the outside, but oftentimes trying to live their entire life proving that they had worth, manhood. Oftentimes without a father who ever spoke into their destiny and said, young man, you are a man, you have value. And they spend all of their life on the outside trying to prove their manhood. But inside, deeply, deeply, deeply insecure. Saul has a calling on his life, affirmed by the prophet, confirmed by God, appraised by the people. Yet when it's time to step up to leadership, he's hiding in the baggage. God is calling him to step up, and he's found hiding because his own insecurities. As I've looked at the life of Saul and contrasted it with the life of David, two imposing leaders, I ask myself, what's the difference here? In fact, when I look at David's sin compared to Saul's sin, it seems, like, it seems like Saul's sin are minor compared to David's sin. Saul steps up and offers a sacrifice, doesn't wait for the prophet. It seems like a minor infraction in my mind. David commits adultery with a married woman, Bathsheba, taking a bath. Easy to remember. And then he has, gets her pregnant and works on a system so that her husband would be murdered. Adultery and murder compared to offering a sacrifice kind of out of line? Uh, like, hey, God, I don't understand it. You take the kingdom away from Saul and you give it to David, and David's sin seemed more grievous than Saul's. But if you dig deeper, dig past the exterior sin and into the heart, you're going to find something revealing about Saul. Look at his life. Look at his years as a king. Look at inside that physique of a king, behind the exterior toughness. And here's what you're going to find. You're going to find a man that has a recording that over and over he's asking himself this question, do people like me? Do people like me? Do people like me? Over and over, you'll see that what propels Saul is this deep insecurity to be liked by others. His decisions are motivated by the need, the drive, the desire to be accepted and liked by others. He's constantly looking around him. When David wins and the people on the street are saying, David is killed or Saul has killed his thousands, David his ten thousands. It deeply irks him that he's compared with others because he's asking himself, do people like me? Do people like me? Do people like me? Absalom, you remember him? David's son had another recording in his mind. Am I important? Do people think I'm important? Do people think I'm important? Rehoboam, another king, had a recording in his mind, do people respect me? Do people respect me? When I look at David, though, in spite of his flaws, when, it's, when he's called a man after God's own heart, it seems like I hear this ongoing recording in David's mind saying, God, are you pleased with me? You see, the difference between a Saul and a David is not the gravity of their sin, but the motivation of their heart. Or a Saul keeps asking, do people like me? And a David seems to be asking, 
God, are you pleased with me? You see, I believe that insecurity causes us to hide when it's time to step up. It's not a new problem. Men have been facing it from, from the very beginning. Oh, you remember the story. Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man, passive Adam gives in to the leadership of his wife, and he gives in to it. They both fall together. Theologians call it the fall of man. Suddenly their eyes are open to their own fallenness and their own nakedness, and they begin to hide in the garden. And God has to, the very first thing that God says after the fall of man is he walks around, and instead of Adam stepping up to the plate and saying, God, we blew it, he hides. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 through 9, then the man and his wife heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the breeze of the day, and they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse 9, so the Lord called out to the man, where are you? I just think it's interesting that he called out to the man. Hello? It was Eve that took the initiative, but he calls out to the man. Hello? Adam, where are you? Hey, Adam, I created you. I called you to lead. You were first. Hey, Adam, why are you hiding when you should be leading? Saul, where are you? Hiding when you should be leading. It could be the song of our generation. Men that have a call, an anointing, a gifting to lead. Oh no, more than that, a responsibility to lead. Yet when we look around and say, where are they? Oftentimes they're hiding. Hiding why? The deep, nagging voice of insecurity. Do people like me? Can I do this? You see, insecurity will always drive you, even with a calling on your life, to give it up. Number two, write this down. Not only will insecurity lead you to hide when you should be stepping up. Insecurity can lead you to ask, what do people want instead of what does God want? You see the story in 1 Samuel chapter 13, it says, and he waited seven days. You see, Samuel the prophet had told Saul, Saul, I want you to wait seven days, and at the end of seven days, I will show up and will make a sacrifice to God Almighty before we enter into war, before we engage in battle, so wait seven days. Have you ever waited seven days? Have you ever waited when you really needed an answer? Have you ever been in the waiting room when something important was hanging? Have you, have you been there? You know, when something as important is, is about to happen and you're waiting, it seems like a day turns into a year. You're waiting for the results that are going to come from a doctor, and you're calling, you're texting, you're, they say it's three days, and you know, three hours later, hey, any news? It's hard to wait. It's hard to wait when it's something important. It's hard to be in the waiting room when you're expecting an answer, when you're expecting God to show up, when you're anticipating a big decision. It's hard to wait. As some of you are in the waiting room right now. And let me tell you what happens. Insecurity can drive you out of the waiting room through the door of compromise unless you determine, God, I'm looking to you, not to others. Insecurity can drive you out of that waiting room. There's men in this auditorium right now, you've been praying for that woman, believing that God will lead you to that godly woman that loves Jesus. 
and happens to be a runway model, too. <laughs> and you're waiting. You're guarding your purity. It gets hard. Your standards start dropping. You know, she's got to love Jesus. Okay, she doesn't have to look that good. I wanted a real godly woman. She needs to go to church now. By the time you're done waiting, it's she's a woman and she's breathing is about your standard. It's hard to wait. And especially if you're driven by insecurity, it's hard to wait. And the Bible says he waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offering. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. He was waiting on God. But as he was waiting on God, he had his eyes on people. And when he saw the people scatter, when he saw the confidence of men start to melt away, he wasn't saying, God, I'm looking to you. God, I'm waiting for you. He was looking at people. He was asking, what do people think of me? They must not think I'm a good leader. They're, they're probably afraid. They're melting away. And so as he looked at people, instead of looking at God, he was tempted in his own flesh and his own manipulation to do something to please the people instead of pleasing God. I'm talking to someone here. He knew he was supposed to wait, and he knew that it was only the prophet that had the power to offer the sacrifice, that he would be stepping out of his lane, getting out of his role, that he would be acting in disobedience to step into a role that he was never called to step into, but yet he disobeyed because he looked at the people instead of looking at God. Insecurity will do that to you. Don't allow your insecurity to drive you out of your God-given position of waiting. The longer you wait, the louder the door of compromise starts to shout to you. Waiting is hard. But when you're insecure, it's harder to wait on God. I've told this story before, but let me, let me tell you a story that happened to me early on in ministry. I started to pastor in this little inner city church in the southwest side of Chicago. I had, it wasn't my dream, my goal. It was just the leading of God. This church was hidden in, in an insignificant place, and I didn't have a worship team. My salary was $8,000 in a building that was kind of crumbling. 18 people would show up. I had a degree. Gangbangers were on the steps. I had to walk past them as they kind of smirked at me and sold drugs right on the corner of 44th and Polina. And I would preach to an empty auditorium. I had a worship leader that led worship like this with no instruments. People would drive into the neighborhood and drive out. People were fleeing that community. And so after a few months there, after being there for a while, hard, slow return, difficult place. My friends were going off to other places, getting their first ministry positions at big churches with decent salaries prominent places. I'm in the inner city. Gunshots. Poverty. Violence. A forgotten corner. No one's moving there. Everybody that can is moving out of there. 
And you know, if you're not really grounded in who you are in Jesus, if you don't know your identity, if you're not there because of a call, it's easy to try to get your significance out of what you do. Hello? Just ask a man that loses his job and you'll see a man that struggles with insecurity. And if you've been in the unemployment line for 10 months, I've seen powerful men in high positions that lose their job and in months they're sniveling with insecurity because they get their identity out of what they do in their paycheck. Now we're wired that way. And so I'm starting to struggle with, is this my calling? And while I'm struggling with my own insecurity, struggling with my own identity, wondering if this is, is this what I'm supposed to do? I thought I had a gifting. I got 18 people I'm preaching to. And they're not like the top echelon of society. And I get a call from a university that asked me if I could do the benediction and convocation at a big gra uh, graduation. They happened to be hosted at the Rockefeller Center in the University of Chicago. You ever been there? Prestigious, ornate, world class. And they asked me, they called me reverend. No one called me reverend. I was 21. And so I said, sure. And I got to this place, and it was a big ceremony. People had flown in from all over the world for this graduation. And I talked to the master of ceremonies, and they had me put a gown on and put a hat on. And, and, and this was a prestigious university that was inviting me to do the benediction and convocation. And, and so I'm walking up to the platform with all these people that have come from all over the world. Finally, someone, I'm at a prestigious place, a Rockefeller Center, a, a place of intellect and doctors and lawyers and business people from all over the world have come, and they're in this auditorium. And on the way up to the platform, the master of ceremonies tells me, we know that you're a smart young man. You have a future. We've been told that. By the way, this is a non-sectarian event. We'd appreciate if your prayers would be non-sectarian. I'm saying, mm, hello? Excuse me? What does that mean? Like words like Jesus and Bible and those things. Remember, there's people from a lot of different religions. Could you keep those out of your comments? I'm like, well, I, uh, we know that. So I sit on the platform and I think, man, I'm at the Rockefeller Center. And when your identity is insecure and you're asking, do people like me? Am I important? You can compromise the very essence of your core, the very essence of your belief on the altar of insecurity if you're asking, do people like me? You will bend and shape your beliefs and your values to those that are around you. And I sat on that nice, ornate chair, looked out this prestigious setting, and then I heard, and now for the convocation, the Reverend Mark Job will be leading us. I got up to that ornate pulpit, and I looked out to that audience, and I could tell there was a diverse crowd from different religions and backgrounds. And I prayed, and I prayed exactly how they wanted me to pray. I didn't at once mention the name of Jesus, the Bible. I prayed the most generic, culturally acceptable PC prayer that you would expect. You know why I did it? Because inside, I was wrestling with the questions, do people like me? And that, and that collided with, is God pleased? And to my shame, I sat down, looked over at the master of ceremonies. He gave me a nod, approving nod, like you did a great job and sat down. You ever been there? You ever felt the pressure? 
You ever felt conviction? And I sat down at that chair, and immediately I felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Immediately. Immediately what started going through my mind is I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Foolishness to those that are perishing, but life to those my face got flushed. I don't know what doctor said what and what politician said what they said. I was oblivious because in my mind, I was struggling with this battle within me. Do I please people or do I please God? And finally, by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, under conviction, I was kind of brought out of my days by the words, and now Reverend Job will give the benediction. But this time I was ready. <laughs> so I got up and I said, I know this is a non-sectarian event, but I'm going to pray in the only name that I know how to pray in. And this time I prayed like a Pentecostal preacher. <laughs> I mean, I think I even raised my leg up there and, I, you know, I... I, I prayed a couple times in the name of Jesus, and I was blessing people and praying the Bible, and, and I, I, I just thought, I got to make up. Lord Jesus, forgive me for being an insecure leader that caves in to political pressure because I'm asking, do people like me instead of God? Are you pleased with me? When I was done praying, I took my long robes. I didn't wait to say hi to the president, the vice president, anybody else that was on stage. The guy came up after me and stumbled and said, uh, uh, okay, we're dismissed. And I was halfway down the aisle already, the robe flowing all the way behind me real fast like this. A girl jumped out in front of me and said, Pastor Mark, I said, here it comes. And she said, thank you. I've been a student here for three years, and they've invited Christian pastors, and never, none of them have ever prayed in the name of Jesus. Thank you for doing so. And I was never invited back. <laughs> never even considered to come back. But I'm going to tell you something that I didn't lose. I may have lost my invitation that day, but I didn't lose my core heart and value. I want to tell you something. Saul's insecurity led him to look at people and instead of asking this question, God, are you pleased with me? He was asking himself, Do pe are people pleased with me? He looked at the scattering crowd instead of looking at God and saying, God, I'll wait even though it's hard, even though it doesn't make sense, even though it seems like leadership suicide to do this. I'll do what you called me to do. Number three. Not only will insecure lead you to hide when you should be stepping up, lead you to look at people when you should be looking at God, but insecurity also can lead you to assume roles that are not yours to take on. It says, and Saul offered up the burnt offering, verse 10. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. If he had waited an hour, if he had waited on God, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. And the very first thing that the prophet says is, what have you done? What have you done? Come on, man of God, what have you done? Well, pastor, you don't know. My marriage is so hard, so difficult. This woman, I've been praying and believing. I've been waiting for her heart to change. I, I, I feel like I'm married to the ice queen. I've been waiting for her, to, for her to fall out, but it's not happening. What have you done? God called you to wait, wait. Persevere, endure. What have you done with your leadership? with your calling. What have you done? Getting out of the door of waiting through the door of compromise, lying, cheating, bending your values, compromising your integrity. What have you done? 
And Saul responds to the prophet, and he said, when I saw that the men were scattering, that you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor, so I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Oh yeah, so I saw, I thought, I felt. When he should have been saying, God, I listen to you, and your word trumps what I see, what I think, what I feel. The Bible tells us that his insecurity caused him to assume a role that was never his to take on. I want to ask you, has insecurity caused you to assume some roles that you were never called to take on? Some of you are drained in life because you're trying to do what the Holy Spirit is supposed to do because your own insecurity is driving you to try to be someone else's Holy Spirit. Amen. Sometimes insecurity will make you try to live up to the expectations of other people. And so you try to please them by taking on things that God never asked you to take on. And so you're, you're trying to be someone's Savior when there's only one Savior. His name is Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you may be an ambassador, but you can save no one. You can heal no one. You can change no one. You are simply a vessel that points to the one who can. You are not responsible for people's salvation. Jesus is responsible. You are a carrier of the gospel message. You are a conduit of the power of the Holy Spirit. But there is one who paid the price. There is one who heals, saves, delivers, changes, convicts. His name is Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when you try to step into that role, you have stepped into sacred territory that does not belong to you. You're offering sacrifices that you never had the right to do. You're assuming roles that don't belong to you to assume. And when you carry a role that's not yours to carry, you will soon become weary of carrying something that God never wired you to carry. Some of you are worn out, not because of what God has put on you, but because of what you've put on yourself and decided to carry because of the pressure of people pleasing rather than God pleasing. Leaders do that all the time. You know, we, men, we're notorious for that. We try to be the solvers, the fixers. Don't worry, I'll take care of it, people. Anybody here like that? I remember when I first got married, I went on a honey, my honeymoon. I was dirt poor but I saved up enough money to buy tickets to go to Europe. Now, once I got to Europe, I didn't have any money to do anything in Europe, but <laughs> my dad lived in, in Spain. My parents lived in Spain, so he left me a car and a tent in the trunk. And so I took my bride, and I said, Honey, we're not going to stay at any hotels, but I got a tent in the trunk, and we'll drive as much gas as we have. We'll stop at a camping place. And uh, we did our honeymoon with a tent and ham sandwiches and a car, and it was great. Uh, a few years ago to celebrate our decades of marriage, I told my wife, hey, why don't we put a tent in the trunk? And she said, I'm beyond tents now. But we were, I speak Spanish because I grew up in Spain, and so we were driving to Italy, and my wife said, well, how are you going to get around in Italy? And I said, don't worry about it. it Italians like Spanish. You know Spanish, you pretty much know Italian. I was trying to make myself be something more, like, I don't worry, I got Italian down. So we were looking for a camping place, and it was kind of late at night, and I stopped by the toll booth, and she said, you don't speak Italian. I said, watch this. So I said, le camping place, and uh, uh, donde esta the camping place? Uh, And the toll, toll booth guy goes, no, 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 My wife says, what did he say? I said, easy. 
he said that the camping place is in a town called Yusita. <laughs> she was so impressed. <laughs> I'm driving and I keep seeing the signs Yusita. So I said, we're close. 40 minutes into it, I discover that Yushita means exit. <laughs> I'm looking for a town called Yushita, but it means exit. And now we arrive at our camping place at two in the morning. I mean, she is livid. Our first fight. She won. <laughs> Set the pace for our whole marriage. <laughs> but you know, we want to be something that we're not. We want to please people and act like we have more than what we have, present ourselves as being bigger than what we are, smarter than what we are, taking on and assuming roles that we're never prepared to assume, but acting like out of the pressure of people, assuming things that God never called us to take on. You're weary, burdened, overwhelmed, anxious. You can't sleep at night. You're stressed out, not because of life, not because of pressure, but because you've taken on things that God never asked you to take on. You're assuming the responsibility for things that God said, I'll take care of that. That's not yours to take. Oh, I know you have a prodigal son or daughter, and you can pray, and you can fast, but listen, you can't turn them around. That's God's duty. Only he can convict them in that seedy bar in the middle of the night where you can't go. You can worry and you can try to manipulate and you could try to buy them back and pressure them back and you could try to convince them and alien them away. But only God can do certain things that you and I have no power to do. Give it over to God. Stay in your lane. And number four, lastly, so you, insecurity can lead you to hide, it can lead you to do what people want, it can lead you to assume roles that aren't your, yours to take, and listen, insecurity can lead you to sabotage your own legacy and your spiritual destiny. Verse 13, you acted foolishly, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now, your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Saul spent the next 40 years throwing spears at the person that was fulfilling the calling that he had lost. Saul lost his legacy. He abdicated his influence. He sabotaged his destiny because he allowed his own insecurity to override the call of God on his life. I'm just kind of wondering out loud if there may be men in this place who's recording since you're young, since your teenage years, has been driven by, do people like me? Do people like me? Do people like me? And I, am I important? Am I important? Am I important? Do people respect me? Do people respect me? When all along your identity needs to be found in Christ. When all along your value, who you are, needs to be driven by what Scripture declares over your life. Paid in full. And I wonder if some of you are hiding in the luggage when you should be stepping up to the plate of leadership. I'm wondering if your household is on autopilot while you sit in the big chair with your Dunkin' Donuts coffee 
watching reruns of The Office, checked out, letting your wife really lead the household because in your mind, you don't think you can. I wonder if you're hiding from your call. I'm wondering if you've allowed your insecurity to cause you to hide from God, cause you to take on things that aren't your own, cause you to lose the influence and legacy that God has called you to. I'm just wondering out loud, wondering out loud if God is calling someone to break the cycle of insecurity in your life. See, I believe there's men in this auditorium that have a cycle to break, a bold step to take, and a legacy to make. You know it if you have. You know it if you've allowed that lie to perpetuate inside of you. You know it. You know if you're living with that. Do people like me? Do people like me? Do people like me? Let me tell you, if you're living with that going over and over in your mind, you're pretty much unhappy living like that. And you're losing influence as you try to gain it. You're sabotaging your legacy because when, when all is said and done, there's one question that needs to reverberate in our heart and soul, and that is this, Lord, are you pleased with me? Lord, are you pleased with me? Amen. Could I ask you to stand? Amen. Don't give it up. Saul did. Don't give it up. Saul lost it. Don't give it up. Fight for it. Hang on to it. Don't give it up on the altar of insecurity. Don't, don't give up your legacy, your calling, your destiny, your influence, the leadership that he's called you. Don't give it up. You regain it by making a decision, Lord, I'm not going to be driven. I'm going to identify the lie. Do people like me? Do people like me? Am I important? Am I important? Do people respect me? I'm going to repent of that, God. I'm going to lay it at the altar and say, God, it's led me to sinful behavior. It's led me to act in ways not in line with you, God. It's led me to give up my influence and give up my leadership. And Lord Jesus, I'm repenting about it now, and I'm determining before you, God, that I will have a heart of King David, not a heart of King Saul. I'm moving my heart back to say, Lord, are you pleased with me? That in the morning I will ask, are you pleased with me? When I walk into work, I'm not going to ask, do people like me? When I go to church, it's not about, do people like me? Do people respect me? I, that's not how I'm going to lead that my family. That's not how I'm going to do my job. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer it on the sacrifice of Jesus and say, Lord, this is about, do I have a heart for you, God? I'm going to have a heart of King David that says, Lord, are you pleased with me? And when I struggle with my insecurity and when I wrestle with do people like me and when I'm tempted to try to prove to people that I'm a somebody and that they should respect me and when I try to throw names around and when I try to tell people how important I am, I'm going to go back to the cross and I'm going to say I'm a son of the living God. And Lord, if you like me, who cares if the rest of the world doesn't? Because I'm secure in you, Lord. As we close our time together, maybe you need to bow your head before the Lord.
and determine before God, God, I won't give it up. I want to pray for you as we close, but I believe that there's some men here that you need to lay this at the foot of Jesus and say, God, I, I, I can't, I won't, I refuse to allow my own personal insecurity to sabotage my call. And so, God, today, I come back to the heart of David. I repent of a Saul's heart. And I embrace the heart of David with flaws, with issues, with weaknesses, but one that continues to look to God and say, Lord, are you pleased with me? If you feel comfortable doing so, could you just raise your hands to the Lord as I pray for you? Lord, you see these men, each one of them with a calling, a unique calling, a legacy, Lord, that you've called them to. I pray today, God, that we would lay at the cross at the feet of Jesus our insecurities that drive us to sabotage our call. And I pray that today, Lord, that men that have been hiding in the luggage will step up to the plate of leadership. I pray that men that have been sidelined by insecurity, God would get back into the game of their calling, asking themselves, Lord, I, I move forward with asking, are you pleased with me, Lord? Pray against the lies that the enemy has bound so many men with of their own incompetence, their own lack of worth, their own trying to prove to the world that they actually matter and value. Father, I pray that we would find it in our position in Jesus. I pray, God, that these men will go back to their homes and their works, their church, their ministries, God, with a new question, Lord, are you pleased with me? with a new power, with a new surrender to the feet of the cross of Jesus. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.